Good morning. This is our midweek recording, and we're back in the uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last week we had some technical issues, got all that solved, and we're back recording again for our midweek Bible study. And this is a longer chapter, so we're going to do part one and part two of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 on the next two weeks. Let's go to prayer right now. Our Lord Jesus, we ask you, uh, we ask you to bless and anoint. We ask you, Lord, to watch over the uh, the equipment, the charging mechanism, all that, everything working right. We ask you, Lord, to keep the doors open for the message to go out. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to anoint this message today by the power of the Holy Spirit and deliver it and open hearts to receive the Word of God today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to blow the shofar, inviting God's people to, to hear his word. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, now this chapter, Paul is, he's, now you got to go back and get the setting in, in, in context here. Paul is talking to uh, Greeks in the Corinthian city in Greece and uh, he, he is addressing the first part of this chapter. He's addressing this issue, and he brings it up throughout the chapter. This issue of the, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and the bodily resurrection of those who believe in Christ in the end times. That all will receive a glorified body. When we see Him, we'll be like Him. The Scripture says, and so we'll be in a glorified body, a resurrected, glorified body. It won't be like this physical body. Remember, Jesus could uh, walk into a room without opening the door. Uh, it's part part uh, body, part spirit. Uh, I don't and don't send me emails asking. Well, explain that. I don't understand it. We'll know when we receive one. Okay. Uh, in Paul, in this chapter, uh, he's speaking to these Corinthians and the, the, the Greeks. Um, and some of the Greeks even mocked the idea of a bodily resurrection. Well, uh, people don't rise from the dead, and why would somebody want to rise from the dead? According to the Greeks, the physical body was a barrier uh, to keep you from going to the afterlife, and you had to dispose of this physical body, this barrier, and there was no need for another body of any kind. But this is this Paul explains that the resurrection... And receiving a glorified body, receiving a body like Jesus' body, is the completion of God's salvation plan for his saints. It, it, it really fulfills the, the full uh, plan of God for his people. What is something that happened since Adam and Eve sinned? Uh, sin brought death upon the human race. Adam and Eve weren't supposed to die. They weren't supposed to die at all. Uh, it brought death into the human race and the fear of death. And so one of the greatest enemies of mankind is death. And, and many view this as an enemy of mankind, and it is. And, and the, the, the ultimate uh, goal is this last enemy, this, this final enemy will be defeated. Death will have no more power over mankind. No one will fear death. Death will be abolished will be living in a glorified body. So resurrection is important. Not only that, but the resurrection of the Lord. If there's no resurrection, then there's no salvation. He, he, the, the prophetic word over the Messiah that he would, be, he would come, he would be crucified, and he'd rise again on the third day. We serve a risen Savior. He's not dead. He's not buried in a grave like some of the other, uh, like, like Buddha and Confucius and all these people that uh, are worshipped, uh, our, our Savior is a risen Savior. He's alive. He's a resurrected, risen Savior. And uh, he teaches, Paul teaches the importance of resurrection as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel of Christ and to Christians who believe on the Lord for that end time resurrection. Later in the chapter, in, in uh, verses 50 through 58, we'll get into that next week, Paul tells of the rapture of the church and the resurrection and how all of this will take place. Uh, so we'll get to that next week. Uh, the gospel, let's read verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the, the gospel 
which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand. And so the gospel, the salvation message, and the forgiveness of our sins includes the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the renewal of all creation and the glorified church, all believers in glorified bodies. In verse 2, by which you are also saved if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. So it is important that we receive this gospel message as it was preached by the apostles, as, as it was given by the Lord and preached by the apostles. And the preserving faith, for faith that's going to last is faith that holds fast to the truth. And this is so important in the day in which we live because the gospel of Christ is being perverted by many uh, teachers and preachers and watered down. And there are vital el elements of the gospel of Christ that are being uh, uh, thrown away. Uh, the virgin birth of Christ, uh, that, that Jesus is God, uh, and, and he's not just a man or a prophet or a great teacher. He is both man and God, and he, he came, he died, and he rose again. And th this message of the gospel cannot be watered down at all. If it is, then it's not a true gospel, and people cannot be saved by a false gospel that's being taught. Uh, and that Jesus is the only way to the Father. That's being watered down too, that, oh, there may be other ways to come to Christ. Uh, some are teaching uh, even the atheists can get saved if they do good works. That's not the gospel of Christ. That's a false gospel. Uh, in, in verse, uh, so in verses 5 through 8, let's look at that, uh, or, or 4, 5, 4 through 8. And it says... Um, for, uh, let's go to verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which, also, uh, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas and by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain uh, to this present. And some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James and all the apostles. Then last, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. And so it, the apostle Paul is making it clear that not only did Jesus die on the cross, buried in the tomb, and then rose again on the third day, but he was seen. He was seen alive. That's important. He was seen alive. Even the Jewish historian Josephus recorded that he was seen alive by many. Here, uh, Paul is giving some names. He's given the apostles and, and the 500 and, and James. And then he says, also by me. What is he saying? There are numerous credible witnesses. The, the, witness, the evidence is clear and the witnesses are credible that that saw Jesus alive and walked with him and talked with him after his resurrection. That's important. That's very important. Let's go on to verse 9. Uh, uh, Paul is talking about himself as, as the least of the apostles, and, and he goes on to explain this in verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles uh, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God... I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was, uh, was, was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach to you, and so you believed. And, and Paul is making it clear. We preach the truth, and you believe that truth. And, and what does he say back in verse 2? Hold fast. Hold on to the truth. Don't let anybody pry the truth out of your hands. Don't let anybody pry it out of your mind or out of, or out of your heart. There is so much false teaching. We've got to know our, our Bible. We've got to know the true message of the gospel of Christ so that it not be pried away from us, it not be watered down, it not be made foggy in our thinking or in our heart. We need to know who we believe in. We need to know what he has accomplished for us. We need to know the promise of his return. And we need to share the true message 
of the gospel of Christ. Let's go to verse uh, 12 now. Uh, he's talking about the risen Savior, our hope. We have no hope unless Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. He's saying there is no, there is no salvation. There is no uh, risen Savior if, if there is no resurrection. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. In other words, don't bother preaching the gospel of Christ if you don't believe in the resurrection. He was, he was admonishing them, let, let go of your, your old philosophical Greek teachings that there is no resurrection and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believe on his cross and his resurrection. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. He's saying if there's no resurrection, then how could Jesus have risen from the dead? For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That's how important the resurrection of the Lord is. The cross and the resurrection of the Lord, the cross, the burial, that the burial is the proof that Jesus wasn't just hiding in that cave for three days. The burial is proof that he died on the cross, he was buried in the tomb, and the resurrection, the stone rolled away, and the missing body of Jesus proves his resurrection. In verse 16, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. And then in verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, those who have believed in Christ and, and have died, then they have perished for eternity because there is this salvation. There is no salvation. If this life, if, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiful. 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 Now, in some translations, it says miserable. Uh, if, if all we have is believing in Christ today and there's no resurrection, there's no eternal life, then what's the point? Okay. And then in verse uh, 20, the apostle says, but if Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit, fruit the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So if so, Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. For as Adam, as in Adam all die, we all receive uh, sin and death, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Believing in Christ gives you eternal life and salvation forever and ever with the Lord. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Now, uh, that, that is important. Christ, the first fruits. The first fruits, you'll hear this a lot in Scripture, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Christ, the first fruits. The first fruits are, are, were the evidence that the harvest is ready, that the harvest is about to take place. A great harvest is to come. The first fruits were a small uh, portion of the crop that began to get ripe first, and that was evidence that here comes the harvest. Here comes the harvest. And that's the proof when Christ rose from the dead, that's proof to us that the great harvest is coming. A great resurrection is coming. And in verse 24, then comes the end. And when he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, and he puts an end to all rule and authority and all power. When Jesus comes and rules, he will, he will be the King of kings and Lord of lords, all rule and authority and power will be abolished. The Lord will ru rule the earth for a thousand years from Jerusalem. He will be the only authority on the face of the earth. He will rule a kingdom. He will, there will be peace on earth for a thousand years under the rule and reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says he must reign 
till he has put all enemies under his feet. At the end of the thousand years, uh, Satan will be released uh, for, for a short season and there will be a rebellion of any who, who, who do not want to follow Christ and all rebellion will be done away with, all evil will be done away with, and death will be done away with. Look at verse 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things, verse 28, now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Once Jesus has completed the work here on earth in his, his thousand years kingdom, then all, all authority, Jesus sits again at the right hand of the Father, all authority is offered to the Father that all things will be put under his authority, complete authority. And uh, we're going to stop right there because this is such a long chapter. We'll resume with verse 29. Uh, and this chapter uh, goes on to verse 58 when, in that last section when uh, Paul is explaining the rapture of the church and the resurrection even of all of those who believed on the Lord and have died. They'll, they will receive their glorified bodies first and then we that are alive and remain will be caught up and receive our glorified bodies and we all will be forever with the Lord. Let's go to prayer. Our Lord Jesus, we come to you. And Lord, these things, uh, these seems seem to the natural mind so wonderful, so mighty, so so awesome, so uh, uh, beyond our understanding. And Lord, uh, we, we believe these things by faith. We don't have to figure them out. We don't have to know them. Just like we didn't have to calculate everything about salvation, all we had to do was uh, come before you, Lord, repent of our sins, and believe on you for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for this pure and holy message of the gospel of Christ. Oh, Lord, I pray protection over your people that the gospel will not be perverted in their mind. I pray for those that are seeking you that will, they will find the true gospel of Christ. If there's one listening today and doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that they will believe this pure message of the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and on the third day he rose again to give us eternal life so that we can be with him forever and ever. If you believe that message of the gospel of Christ, ask the Lord to forgive your sins, come into your heart and be Lord of your life. I pray, Lord Jesus, that the church, that the body of Christ will stay pure in the gospel of Christ and not allow intrusion of false notions that would water down the gospel. Lord, we purely want to receive your message and your work on the cross and your resurrection in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening in. Uh, there'll be an encouraging weekend message coming to you. And we thank you. And we, uh, we ask you to continue in your word. Keep your Bible open. These messages are to stir you up so that you will study your Bible. Thank you and God bless you.